So you're an attorney and you've decided to go out on your own. Now what? You need a plan and you're not alone. Join expert host Adriana Linares and her distinguished guests on New Solo. Tune in to the lively conversation as they share insights and information about how to successfully run your law firm here on Legal Talk Network. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of New Solo on Legal Talk Network. I'm Adriana Linares, your host. I'm a legal technology trainer and consultant. I love helping law firms and lawyers use technology better. Before we get started, I want to make sure and thank our sponsors. Thanks to Ross Intelligence, the legal research platform that leverages AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Go to rossintelligence.com for a 14-day free trial. Nexa formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800-267-9371 or online at nexa, N-E-X-A dot com. Thanks to our sponsor, Clio. Check out Clio's Daily Matters podcast, featuring valuable perspectives on legal in the COVID-19 era. Listen to Daily Matters at clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Visit lawclerk.legal to learn how to increase your productivity and your profits by working with talented freelance lawyers. All right, everyone. So today's guest is my good friend, dear buddy, Brett Burney. Hey, Brett. Hi, Adriana. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Before we launch into just tips and tricks, and I have some questions for you, tell everyone a little bit about yourself in case through some weird world, they don't know who you are. (laughs) Well, I've always liked the way you describe what you do, Adriana, like just simply helping lawyers better use and utilize technology. I, I love that because... You know, whatever way that we've come into this, and you and I have known each other for a long time, and we know we have lots of mutual acquaintances that that do this, Mm -hmm. it's just having a passion for helping legal professionals better understand how they can incorporate technology, right? You and I both hear all the time from legal professionals that they're not computer literate, they're not very tech savvy, so they use that as an excuse to sort of just not be responsible for understanding how technology can can work. And that's really sad <laughs> in today's sad. world because especially right now, right? Like you really need to have an understanding. And I mean that in a very general and broad sense. A lot of the stuff that you talk about with u- utilizing email or incorporating that better, just understanding how to better manage your practice. One other area that I work in quite a bit is electronic discovery, working with litigators. And that whole idea of helping people understand the technology is extremely important in the discovery, not just understanding how to manage your practice in there, because logistically that's very important, but also as litigators today, when we exchange evidence, (laughs) it's all electronic, right? Today, at least on the civil litigation side, right? All of the evidence, and I mean actual evidence that that we exchange and produce to each side, is email, it's electronic documents, it's now text messages and social media channels. All of that is electronically stored information. And so as litigators, you really have a duty, as you and I know, the technology competence duty these days, but you have a duty to really understand how that technology works, not to be an expert on it, but understand like where email is stored and how you can gather that email and produce it to the other side, that's very important so that you can be a better advocate for your client or a better counsel to your client, right? And helping them do that. So those are the areas that I run in. A lot of the general technology things, like I know that that you do a lot. I love talking about using the iPad and the iPhone and mm-hmm. mobile devices in your practice, but probably my day-to-day work is a lot more on the e-discovery side, litigation support technology. I love uh, sending you my e-discovery uh, users and also my Mac <laughs> yes. people. So when I get stumped, yes. um, you're one of my my go tos for for Macs and eDiscovery. And I'll just sort of riff a little bit on what you're saying, which is at this point, this has been a particularly trying time for me because I've spent the past twenty years doing nothing but trying to get lawyers to have some level of technology competence. <laughs> right. And right. I, I have to say, you know, I've usually feel pretty good about it. But let me tell you, man, this crisis has really brought out the 
incredibly incompetent mm. users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it has been really trying for me because helping lawyers with technology and their support staff and paralegals and everyone else that works in a law firm, I have to say is probably the only thing on this planet I have patience for. It's amazing. Like I even, right. I even can't believe how much patience I have, but I will tell you during the past few weeks with so much exasperation, so much rush, so much pressure, I've lost it a couple of times. Mm. Been like, 10 years, yeah. okay? You have yeah. had 10 years yep. Yep. to move That's to right. the cloud. You've had 10 years. And, and you know, even if you've had 10, what happened to the last two? What happened to the last three? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Why so stagnant? Right. I'm sorry you still have a server and you're four people, okay? No law firm with four people should have a server. Right. So right. I have to say, I have lost. Just, just my, let it out, Adrian. Just let it out. It's good. It's, it's been good. A I mean, times. it is unfortunate that it takes a pandemic <laughs> to get people to sort of wake up to this. In fact, I was just talking with um, a reporter from ALM. He was he's you know doing several stories, obviously lately on on how technology is working. You know, from from e discovery platforms. Uh, but he was asking generally about like court technology, right? Even the courts, oh, Adriana, please. right? I, I mean, most federal courts have at least embraced technology to a certain extent, because I'm talking about trial technology, mm -hmm. right? Most of the time when we talk about that, or having an understanding even on the e-discovery side, how to manage the parties. But you and I both know when you start getting down to state and county levels, mm -mm. sometimes it's just really sad. And, and I was just even thinking about this, you know, it's taken this pandemic to really even have court sort of wake up and understand. Yeah. I mean, I love court reporters, but I mean, there is technology out there that in some <laughs> cases that can transcribe a lot of this. And I love court reporters. I do. And they are absolutely necessary. But maybe there are some situations where you don't have to wait until you have a live person there or, or it was something I even thought about today because we've seen a lot of these orders come through notaries, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, 250 sure. years ago, we needed... Yes. People, actual in-person witnesses <laughs> that could be there to say, yes, I'm watching this person sign with an actual quill, you know, an ink <laughs> pen. But today we have other technology that can take the place of having an in-person witness, right? Many states today have temporarily forgiven, you know, having yeah. the in-person, right? So it's a little sad, I think, between you and me, you and I can say that word to you because it's sad for it's us sad. that it's like it takes a pandemic it's to sad. get people to wake up and understand how technology can actually be fruitfully helpful <laughs> and support what you're doing as opposed to just having this attitude that, well, that's for the nerds and the geeks. Well, right. well that might be true. I'm a nerd. But it's like, no, you need to understand how to best embrace a lot of this so that you can be a better professional. I completely agree with you. So... Oh, let's do some of that. Let's help them be better <laughs> professionals. Um, I think we should definitely continue giving tips. I'm always, look, I love what I do and I've always loved it. I just would love to get yes. to an advanced level, right? I am still teaching lawyers what the right click does on a mouse. I had yes, an I a, attorney <laughs> a couple months ago who we were rolling out net documents. She insists on having a Mac because it's the only thing she knows how to do and work. And, and then as I'm training her, I said, well, right click on that option right there. And after telling me mm. what an extensive Mac user she is and how it was the only way she'd be able to work, she responded to me by saying, mm, there's no right click on a Mac. <laughs> and I said, and there we are. So, yeah. And there uh, we are. <laughs> and there we are. Drink. <laughs> All right. So, Brett, you and I had a list of tips and tools that we were going to rattle off, but Lawrence yes. came in with a stopwatch <laughs> and cut he was us very off. Mean. He was mean <laughs> before we could get through our list. Uh, and I had worked really hard on my list to come up with new and different yeah. um, tools, services, gadgets, or apps that I hadn't rattled off in the past before. So I want to talk about a couple of those. And um, let's talk about Text Expander. Let's start there because Ooh, okay. I know that's one of your favorites. It's yes, definitely one of my favorites. And then I have a, I'm actually going to use this opportunity to troubleshoot a technical problem I'm having with Text Expander. Oh, good, goody. Okay. Yeah. So tell everyone what is Text Expander and how can it help us save time and be more efficient and make less mistakes? 
Wow, that's almost like you rehearsed it. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, Adriana, here's one way that I try to explain text expander to so many folks. When I was in law school, which was many, 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 many years ago now, I used an, a, a laptop with, that I carried around with me. And this was a huge nine and a half pound gateway laptop. If you could, it even had a floppy drive in it. Okay. That's how Beautiful. long ago it was. But I took all my notes in Microsoft Word, right? Now, Many times throughout the day, I would have to type the phrase United States Supreme Court. Now, I could type that whole thing, but, you know, I'd want to capitalize the U and the S, right? And this S and the C, because, you know, that's proper, right? I feel like it's proper. And I had to type that entire phrase, four words there. Not that big of a deal, but when you're trying to take notes and listen, that gets a little cumbersome. So sure. I thought I just came up with the most brilliant thing ever, Adriana. The autocorrect function <laughs> in Word, sure. right, yeah. would already correct when I mistyped the, right? I would type H-T-E instead of T-H-E, but yes. it would brilliantly autocorrect it for me. I loved it. So I'm thinking to myself, self, if it could correct little things like that, what if I could sort of like fool Microsoft Word mm -hmm, into mm -hmm. correcting or, or typing United States Supreme Court for me if I just typed... S-U-P-C-T, right? Supreme Court, S-U-P-C-T. And voila, it would immediately expand out to United States Supreme Court. I mean, how many characters did that save me? Tons. I could count it up. But it was great because now instead of taking the time to type all that, just a little tiny snippet of one, two, three, four, five characters and immediately expand that out. Plus, every time it expanded it, spelled it correctly. Because of course, you know, if I mistyped uh -huh. it, I'd have to go back and delete and backspace too much time. Well, think about that. Instead of only working inside Microsoft Word, Text Expander now does that for me in all of my applications. So Across I can board. be typing an email uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. Now, that was sort of using autocorrect in a way that it wasn't exactly right. meant it was for, a good but hack. it worked great. Right. But now today... I talk about using Text Expander as a way to sort of automate your typing. In fact, when I introduce Text Expander, I say this. Here's two questions. Do you type? Right. <laughs> of course we all do. And second question, do you want to save time? Who would not say yes to both of those? Then if you say yes to both of those questions, then Text Expander is going to absolutely improve your technology life. So now what I do, instead of doing like kind of, kind of an autocorrect, I think about things that I type frequently throughout the day, like my office or work phone number, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a phone number, typically, I've got to do shift and use yeah, the pain. parentheses, right, in a space and a dash in there. Not that big of a deal. But if you got to do that several times a day, why are you taking all that time? So now I have, for me, for my business phone number. It's a little bit long. It doesn't have to be this long, but I do biz phone, B-I-Z-P-H-O-N-E. No spaces, no nothing. And immediately it expands out to that phone number and it's 100% accurate every single time. A couple of sure. quick examples. My office mail-in address, the full thing, right? You've got three lines. I've got, yep. <laughs> you've got returns and hard spaces in there and, and, and commas and numbers. I don't want to take the time to type all that out every time. For that one, it's even better. It's office address, but it's abbreviated O-F-F-A-D-D. -D. Yep. No spaces, no nothing. O-F-F-A-D-D. -D. It immediately expands out into my entire office address. It's fantastic. And then lastly, quickly, the dates. I'm constantly typing when I'm taking notes somewhere, but I don't want to take the time to pause what I'm doing Pull up my calendar because I can never remember exactly what day it is, especially mm -hmm. these days, especially right? Especially today. Pull down the calendar and figure out, is it what week this is? I don't, I don't want to take the time to do that. I have a very simple snippet, and that's what you call it in text expander. It's DDT. It's, it's date. It's something I would never type typically within a word, DDT. Just lowercase, three characters, and immediately it expands out into my current date. Is that a built-in one or do I have to create that one? Those are not built-in. Okay. There is a date one built-in. I think it's D-date, D-D-A-T-E, but that's too long for me. <laughs> so, that's too much. So there are some built-in ones that come with Text Expander, but I like to make sure that it's something that I know and that I am familiar with. It just makes sense to my brain. You can use whatever you need. Some people use triggers like semicolon, semicolon, right? right. Something that you wouldn't type 
typically throughout the day right. and you, and it could be a trigger for all your text expander snippets. So I, I love text expander for all the reasons you just said. And so I use, here's a typical sentence that I write that has a hyperlink. It'll say, if you have a few minutes before our call, comma, please visit this link and take this pre-call survey period. Yeah. So it's dot pre-call because pre-call is a word I might actually use, but in my mind, it was the one that I remembered. Right. Would, right. You know, so you have to sort of make up shortcuts that you'll remember. I use it for all sorts of stuff. I, I love text expander. I use it for formatted text, unformatted text. I create different signatures in there. I've put, um, I get a lot of tech support questions about net documents. I've got all right. that stuff in there. So I absolutely love text expander. And is it, what is it about $40 a year? It is. Yes. Do you have a, fact, do you have yeah. a, a discount for us, Brett? I, <laughs> I do because okay. this is how much of a nerd I am that I love text expander so much that I actually even created like a course around it and there oh, a, wow. there's a discount on there. So I'm going to give it to you just be simply because you don't have to go and get the course. You can go and sign up for it separately. But on this website, there is a video that I put up there that will show you exactly what it does. So I always tell people just go there yep. and at least watch it. This is TextExpanderForLawyers.com. So Perfect. it's TextExpanderForLawyers.com. You can go to TextExpander.com. You can see, but this is application that is used in so many different companies and yeah, we verticals. like for lawyers. Exactly. But this is Text Expander for Lawyers. So obviously on that on that website, you can see I give specific examples Great. of what it does on the uh, legal side. For example, one of my, I have a friend that he, I, I love this. He practices in Paducah, Kentucky. I just oh, love Paducah. saying Paducah, Don't we which all? is home to the the uh, United, the American Quilt Museum, by the way, if you've ever <laughs> been there. Anyway, so so Jeff it practices there, but he typically had a divorce petition that he would have to fill out every single time. Well, he Guy and loves I were to get married. <laughs> he and I were at a conference and I was talking about text expander and he said, you know, I've got this form that I have to have my assistants fill out every time. Can I use text expander to automate that? Now you and I know there's some other fantastic document automation tools out there, but for what Jeff was doing, this worked out great because even in text expander, not only can it expand out to a full letter, but it'll also give you the opportunity to fill in fields or have a drop down if you want to select certain things. So you can get all kinds of crazy uh, good on the on text expander if you wanted to take it to the nth degree. But I like just thinking about with people on the simplest aspect, and then you can start building on that. I didn't know text expander could do that. So it kind of do, does. So you you expand something and then it stops and asks you a specific question. Yeah, absolutely. And then it keeps filling in. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going yeah, to go take what, you your know, course. You, know, you, you and I know Hot Docs and yeah, those, yeah. You know, some of these others on there, which are, which are huh. great. And I'm not saying Text Expander is a replacement for all those, no. but for some simpler things. Like, for example, I use this all the time when I'm creating email messages. And sometimes, you know, like, like for you, you might want to select a specific link to send somebody. Yep. Well, you could have all of those links in a drop down, for example, and depending on who you're sending the email to, you could say, here's my email, snap it out. And then it would say, well, what's the name of the person you're sending it to? So you could, you know, address it appropriately. Wow. And then you could do a drop down or there's even a uh, pick field. So you can say, I want this sentence to be included and not this one. I mean, it really gets amazing no what kidding. you can do. That's the more advanced I'm stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> well, no, no. I tell people start small because once you, you, you've, you've been doing this for a while. Once you understand the power that's in there with yeah. the simple things, then you can start building on that knowledge. I love it. Um, I'm totally going to figure out how to do that. That's the type of stuff <laughs> I do all day long. And I just haven't, I guess I hadn't thought about it too much. Sometimes though, I find that when I go to expand something, it misses the mark and it pastes whatever was last on my clipboard. Does that ever happen to you? It has. There's a few settings in Text Expanded that you can uh, tweak on there so that mm -hmm. uh, this has happened on the Mac. Because by the way, it happens Text to me Expander, on my Mac too. Yeah. So uh -huh. I mostly have found this to happen on the Mac. Now, by the way, just quickly, Text Expander was originally just a Mac application, but it is now a cloud based service, a subscription, so that it'll work on the Windows side as well. It will also work on your iPhone and your iPad. They even just released a Chrome version, so it can work on the Chromebook as well, which is great because now I can create these snippets and they're shared across all my devices. 
Not only that, but if I were in an office where I needed to share snippets with others, because I do this, I, they're just not in my office. I share my snippets, sections of my snippets with other people, and they can get access to the same snippet. So if I make a change to it, then obviously it changes for them. So I work with a lot of lawyers that do this in their office because right. they want all of their people to use the same snippets. The same because language. Of something, exactly. Yeah. Or I even say this quickly, Adriana, we've touched on this a little bit, but let's say you've got a judge's name that's hard to spell, yep, right? Sure. Or a client's name. What's great about Text Expander, not only does it save you time, but every time you expand a snippet, it's 100% accurate. That's true. Nobody, no, you don't, you never want to misspell a judge's name. No, but they don't like that. So if it's like Respect. Judge Shira Shindlin was a judge up in the Southern District of New York that was a big discovery judge, but I could never remember if I could spell her name with I-E or E-I. I never wanted to misspell her name. No. So I created a snippet that I knew it was J Shira. Her first name I could always spell for some reason, S-H-I-R-A. So J Shira it expanded out into her whole full name and I never had to worry about misspelling her name again. So oh, I use it from awesome. that aspect. It's almost just like when I work with lawyers in firms, I say, make sure you put all your client names in there, right? So that, so that everybody is spelling the client name correctly every right. single time. I love it. So I am a universal technology user. I wish I had taken a picture of this over the weekend. I was testing out a new feature from NetDocuments called ND Mail. And what's happened over the past few weeks is with the disbursement of everyone at home. So all these attorneys, these law firms are on Windows at home. They've got all, I mean, at work at their offices. Now they go home and they're all on, half of them are on Macs. And one of them was on a Chromebook. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this lady on a freaking Chromebook? <laughs> right. I mean, it's just so limiting. But anyway, I have a Mac. I have a Surface. I have an, a really nice Asus laptop that I just got. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have an Android. Yeah. <laughs> I had them all out on my table in the, in the living room and... Had, I call them my babies at that point. I said to my boyfriend, like, look at all my babies. The amazing thing about that was I had text expander and all my snippets and everything that I use all the time on all of those devices, except that Chromebook. But yeah. now you just made my day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They just released this a few months ago. So they don't quite yet have an Android version, but I know they're working on it. Cool. But Mac, Windows, iOS, and yes. then they have the Chrome version now. And man, I love it in iOS, but I have to tell you, I struggle with that app sometimes. I yeah. really do. Yeah. Sometimes I can't get to my snippet and I'm like, where is it? But anyway, yeah. all right, well, let's move on because we could do a whole I know. hour just, on just Texas We just keep Banner. talking about Texas better. I love and it. And we really should because it's such an amazing app and it's so affordable and it's so universal. So I'm really excited to hear about Text Expander for Lawyers. I did not know you have that until we chatted with Lawrence the other day. So I've got it on my list of places to make sure I go visit. And you've got a yeah. discount code on there? There is. In fact, Great. if you look at uh, on that right page, now. you can have a link there. And then also, just by the way, I tell people you can try it for free for, I think they have 15 or 14 days, something like that along those lines. But you know what, if it's not on there, if you have any questions, just co connect with me through that, that website. Always happy to talk about text expander, as you can tell. No, I love it. And I'm going to check it out right now. I feel like Leo Laporte, I'm doing my podcast and I'm looking <laughs> things up at the same time. I love I wish Leo. Leo I know. Don't you think, I wish love Leo him. would call us. I mean, doesn't, Man. doesn't Leo need, need us for a show over there? I wish. I wish. Boy, I've been following him for a long time from oh, the early cool. days but on TV. Good stuff. I know. Me too. But your courses are so affordable. They're only $100 or $160 wow, for yeah. both. And um, yeah. I think that that would totally make itself up in saved time for any attorney that bothered watching this. <laughs> Find the time. You guys have it now. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. Having said that about Text Expander, I just wanted to talk, I'm looking at our list about how we both, so you're a Mac for the most part, right? For the most part, yes. But you also were going to give a good Microsoft app to do as a tip from your list. So yeah. tell me about how, are you a G Suite user and an Office 365 user? How do you live in a hybrid world? Because I do too. Yeah. And I always like to hear yeah. about other people and how they do it. I actually don't have G Suite 
Okay. But I'm in Google platforms all the time. In fact, several of my projects, probably just like you, constantly using Google Drive and Google Docs and even my Gmail account and Google Calendar. Mm -hmm. uh, we even have a Google Calendar for, for the family that we share around. So always using Google products. And in fact, I work with a lot on the litigation side when we do e-discovery, we're collecting from Gmail accounts many mm -hmm. times, right? So sure. we're constantly looking at, at G Suite on the back end, Gmail and Google Vault and everything uh, on those ends. But I do subscribe to Office 365, and which is now going to be Microsoft 365, right? right? They're rebranding because it is just going this way. So and, let me just ask you a quick yeah, question in case you can confirm. I got the notifications, right, that they were going from Office 365 to Microsoft 365. And then right, I, I was listening right. to a podcast, Microsoft Central, I think it's called. Okay. And they confused me a little bit because they made it sound like the term Microsoft 365 was going to be only for their consumer slash family yeah. new set of products. But do you think they're calling it Microsoft 365 across the board? I saw the same thing. I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh. And frankly, the reason that I know this, that you're right, is I believe they will continue to keep the Office 365 branding for what we call the enterprise level subscriptions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So again, I run into this all the time. In fact, when I work with corporate clients, most all corporations today, most companies, right? Anybody that's not a law firm is either in Office 365 or they're in G Suite, right? Mm -hmm. They've all gone to the cloud. So when I work with a law firm or a corporate uh, internal legal department that is trying to collect information for production, for a litigation matter, we are always going to the back end of either G Suite or Office 365. So what we call, these are the enterprise level subscriptions, we call it E3 and E5, right? And I know that as well because many times we'll bump people up in a corporation to an E3 or E5 subscription level because there are e-discovery tools on the back end that allow us to search email and collect it and also search and collect documents from what we call OneDrive for Business or it's basically SharePoint on the back end mm -hmm, that we can mm -hmm. uh, pull from that. So I do believe they are keeping that branding for the enterprise level, but for most of what we work with, Adriana, from like there's the home and, and family subscriptions, yep. right? Mostly for educational and for homes. Uh, in fact, I have one of those because it's for my entire family, right? I can share it with like five up to five members of, of my family. But then we have what then there are the small business uh, things, which I know I just know the, the price. It used to be like business premium, I think, or something like that. It was $12.50 mm -hmm. per yep. user per month. I think that's going to the Microsoft 365 branding. I don't think okay. that's switching, okay. but I could be a little bit wrong. We're, we just got the announcement not too long ago, so yeah, we'll see how well Microsoft does this exactly. Well, cool. Well, I'm a big fan of both. I subscribe to G Suite and they host my email and manage because yeah. I, 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 I really love Gmail, but I cannot stand working in Gmail. <laughs> so I am happy to pay for Office 365. Of course, I need Word and PowerPoint and all that, but I'm happy to have Outlook. So I just bring Gmail into Outlook because yeah. of their GSSMO, yeah. Google Sync Service Microsoft Outlook. Yeah. That's a tip for you, for everyone out there. If you are like me and you have G Suite and Office 365, Gmail a while ago put out a little plug-in or an add-in called GSSMO, Google Sync Service Microsoft Outlook. The thing is it doesn't work with free Gmail. So you have to be a paid subscriber to G Suite and then you can download that little tool and it not only synchronizes your email, it also synchronizes calendar and contacts into Outlook. So I love that. But yeah, your tip that good. you had was going to be about Microsoft To Do, which the reason I'm picking yes. that one out of your list is because on that Microsoft Central podcast that I listened to, they were also touting some new features that it has and they liked. So let me just say quickly, you don't have to have a subscription to Office 365 or Microsoft 365. You do have to have a Microsoft account, which can be a free account, right? In fact, if you have an Xbox, you've signed up for a free Microsoft account, and maybe many of us even have a free Microsoft account. So you just have to have a Microsoft account. Now, but if you do have a subscription to Office 365, then you can combine this to-do app with your Outlook. So quickly, a little bit of history. There was a fantastic to-do or task management app 
from several years ago called Wonderlist, or since it was from Germany and it was spelled W U N, I always said Wunderlist. Yes, definitely it was Wunderlist. Wunderlist. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's so many task and to do management applications out there, Adriana. You and I have been talking about these I for know. so long. There's some really, really great ones like Things and OmniFocus and so many things. Like our friend David Sparks, he loves OmniFocus, and I just I sit and just watch him use it and what he can do with something like that. But I don't always need quite that much control, I guess. I, I've always thought I just need to start with something simple. Maybe I can work up to that. And I love things. I've seen it. I love OmniFocus. But many times I just need to make a simple list, whether it's a shopping list or today's to-do list or things, you know, books that I want to read. Just something simple and Wunderlist helped me to do that when it came out. I loved it. In fact, it was so good that Microsoft purchased Wunderlist, Wunderlist and basically, they're, in fact, they just sent in an email, I think two weeks ago, that they're now going to kill out that entire brand. They have basically taken the best of that application and turned it into Microsoft To Do. Cool. So this is a free app that anybody can download. You do have to have a free Microsoft account, or if you have a subscription to Office 365, you can use that account on there as well. But it's just a beautifully streamlined interface that lets you create a list, and inside the list, you can put individual tasks in there. So I have one literally, like I'll, I'll even just pull it up right here, that I have like books that I want to read or follow-ups after a conference that I wanted, mm -hmm, <laughs> that mm -hmm. I went to, which was several months ago now. But like these are the people that I wanted to follow up. I just wanted to capture that somewhere. Or even I even have ideas like home uh, quarantine ideas, like things I want to do with the kids, right? <laughs> like just anything that I just want to capture, get out of my head so that I know it's captured. Because David, David talks about this. David Sparks talks about this quite a bit too. Just you want to get it out of your head or even David Allen, right? Getting things done. Get it out of your head so that you just capture it somewhere so you're not stressed about forgetting it at some point. And that's what I find with Microsoft to do. Now, that's a very simplest. And it's an app on your iPhone, but also do they have a desktop app or how do you use it on your Mac? Yeah, desktop app. Okay. Yeah, they've just yeah. come out with this. So now with Microsoft To Do, you can get an app for Windows, an app for Mac, an app for Android, an app for an iPhone, iPad, an iPhone. It's all there. And what's great about it is because you're doing it through Microsoft, all of these lists synchronize to all of your devices. It's so and it's beautiful just when that happens. Yes, I love synchronization, especially for, Absolutely. for, for someone like me who I just use everything. Um, right, right. Before we go to our a break, I do want to get one more tip in so we can do a handful at a time. On your list, you also have Field notes. What is that? <laughs> so as much as I am a technology nerd, this was my one analog tip I was going to throw in. Oh, funny. Um, okay. Uh, I'll just put a quick plug in. Uh, I know you follow the attorney at work site as well. Sure. There's, there's, yeah. a, there's a columnist there. I think his name is Bull Garrington Garlington. He's, he's called the analog attorney. And as much as I love the technology, I love his columns because he talks about like the best pencil or the best pen, oh. the best notebook. Well, I don't do a lot of paper anymore, but there is something at like the end of the day, just especially these days, just sitting down and just taking a few notes, like what happened in the day? I, I don't go into all this bullet journaling or any kind of fanciness. I just... What are some of the things that I thought about today or I'm grateful for? Uh -huh. to, you know, something like that. Well, these little field notes, it's a, it's a small company out of Chicago. In fact, I just went and visited their headquarters when we were at uh, ABA Tech Show at the end of February <laughs> before the world imploded upon so, itself. what am yeah. I Googling here to find this? Yeah, so it's- Because I can't um, just Google field notes. Who knows what I'll get? Do I- No, it's Field Notes Brand is, okay. is the website, fieldnotesbrand.com. They're just- they're small. They fit in my pocket. I use this. They're little notebooks? They're little tiny paper notebooks, oh, 48 pages. Cute. And the thing is, I even, I don't subscribe to a lot of things other, you know, from the outside of the technology world, but I subscribe to this. I think it's $120 a year that four times a year, they send me a new packet in the mail. They don't tell you what the new notebook is going to be, but they're just beautiful I, I don't have a lot of notebooks. I don't do the whole, what is it, moleskin. I don't no. do a whole lot of fancy stuff, but this is one of my guilty pleasures that every three months I get a new packet of field notes. And the kids know now that 
It's like, well, there's dad's field notes again coming in. That's really cute. So it's kind of like Moleskine would be how some people, like I know Sam Glover is yeah. a big fan of Moleskine yeah. and, and I know yeah. Ernie also likes their notepads and stuff. So cool. No, this, these are really cute. Yeah. And this is my are, analog pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you know, will. it's funny about that. I'm not a big <laughs> note taker either. I have very, very little paper. But I do like a little notebook just like this to jot things onto, yeah. mostly to keep shopping lists or right. just very ephemeral pieces of information that I have no other place to put because I won't need it for very long. So, okay, right. I like that. I, I, I do have to tell you, I have to purposely make myself, like at the end of the day, pull this out. Because again, with something like the Notes app on my iPhone yeah. or Microsoft To Do, that's where I capture everything. In fact, I just have... She who shall not be named because otherwise all my devices will turn off. I just have her <laughs> like record a note, but I love that now. But at the end of the day, having a glass of wine or something, I just sit there and I've got a pen and it's just, you know, I'm, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's just the, the, the nostalgic aspect of it, but just writing something down and, you know, having a picture, it, it is fun to kind of go back over the last couple of months and just kind of look, especially these days, just reminding yourself what you were thinking about at a time. Yeah. And this is just the way that I do it. That's neat. That's kind of meditative and, and yes. very cool. I write very little as well, but I, I do love a good pen. And I have to say, I still like good old yes. fashioned, like Bic pens in various colors. And I, if I see a cool notebook, I found one in Palm Springs, not that long ago, that's like kind of brown newspaper. And it's this big pad, man, there is really something yeah. soothing about writing and creating yeah. a list. So I think that's a great analog tip. Let's take a quick break and listen to a couple of messages from some sponsors. We'll be right back. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Signing up is free and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you set. Use rebate code NEWSOLO to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. The legal industry is undergoing a fundamental transformation, and the Daily Matters podcast is here to give you a competitive edge. In Daily Matters, Clio CEO Jack Newton interviews prominent legal experts to explore how solo and small firm lawyers can succeed in the current economic environment. To listen, visit clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe to Daily Matters wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. I'm talking to Brett Burney. We're going through some of our favorite tips and tools and services. We've talked about Text Expander. We talked about Microsoft To Do app. Uh, mentioned Field Notes for those of you who like to take notes. These cool little yeah. notebooks. I want to ask you too, from a litigation perspective, which you had started to tell us that a big part of your life is um, e-discovery and helping litigators. Brett, you're a lawyer, right? You or you were a practicing lawyer. I was. Yeah. So you have really good experience. Um, by the way, everyone, if you're looking for an e-discovery consultant, Brett is one of my go-tos. So make sure you Thank reach you. out to him if you need some help. <laughs> I'm curious about PST Viewer from Goldfinch because I often have attorneys say to me, yes. I got some discovery. What do I do with this PST file? And maybe they don't have Outlook or they don't know what to do with it. So one, I want to know why you recommend Goldfinch and is it platform agnostic and how much does it cost and tell us what it does other than it's called PST Viewer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to okay. guess that you can load a PST into it and see all of the emails. All right. So I'm going to geek out on the e-discovery side, Adrian. Okay, There's good. Like a minute. You need to stop me and rein me in. But just quickly, <laughs> this is one of my... So. Uh, just let me, I'm going to go through this quickly. PST is what we know as portable storage table. It's really what it, what it actually stands for, but it is the default file that comes out of Microsoft Outlook or Exchange. Why is that important? Because today, still today, the predominant source for potentially relevant electronically stored information is email. It's amazing what people will say in an email message. Truly. Although I used to say that until social media came along. It's amazing what people will share. <laughs> they would never pick up the phone and say to somebody or say to somebody face to face, which would never get recorded typically, by the way, but they'll say it in an email, which means that it never gets erased. That said, that's why we always go to email. So 
predominantly people use Microsoft Outlook as a way to check their email, just like what you're saying, for either, even from Gmail, for example. Right. So when I am putting in a production request from the other side to supply all of the relevant conversations about this particular matter, whether it's a construction case or real estate matter or a trade secret issue, whatever the case may be, email is typically always the first place we go. Collect that information. How do we collect it? We export it out of, out of Outlook as a PST file, or we collect it from the back end. There's there are various ways. Once you have that PST file, how then do you as counsel, as the attorney, review it? Because of course, you don't want to produce anything to the other side that is confidential or not relevant, right? The idea is we want to only produce what's relevant or responsive to the matter, but not privileged or confidential in some way. So that means you have to read through these emails, or there's lots of technology today that allow you to kind of automatically read through that. So how then do you as the attorney read through those emails and make those determinations? Well, <laughs> most us. people say, if this is a PST file that came from Outlook, I've got Outlook on my computer. I'll just be able to view the PST file in Outlook. Now, that is absolutely correct. Microsoft Outlook will let you view a PST file. However, when you open that PST file that you've got from your client, that by the way, is evidence, electronic mm -hmm. evidence. You, you are don't basically, put that on your computer? You're basically opening that PST file in your own yeah. Outlook. And this, I purposefully use this word, Adriana. I say you are then commingling electronic evidence with your work product. Because when you load that PST file in your Outlook, first of all, you are changing the metadata, which we call spoliation of the data. No but spoliation. It's, it's live email. Mm -hmm. If you just negligently hit the reply or the forward button, yeah. guess what? They're you live. You are working in live email. You're detonating an email time bomb. So then <laughs> beyond that quickly, and I'm going to try to wrap it up. How then do you determine or navigate if it's a relevant message, how do you determine that you need to preserve that? Well, most people say, that's easy. I just make a new folder in my Outlook and I drag the message into that new folder. Oh okay, gosh. I understand that, but then how do you produce it? I, I will tell you, I've worked with a law firm in the past that this is exactly how the litigation team reviewed the email and they literally printed it from Outlook. Yeah, I knew it. I knew there was a printing story coming. <laughs> now, when you print an email message from Microsoft Outlook, whose name appears at the top of the yeah, printout? In the banner. Mm -hmm. The client's name? No. No, your name. Basically, the way I put it is you have now put your digital fingerprints on that email message. I, I always tell people when I'm explaining this, like, what do you do? I say, well, you know, we all know that if a lawyer or even a law enforcement officer goes to the scene of a crime, you don't just pick up the bloody knife with your bare hands <laughs> and then take it back to your office and throw it in your desk drawer, do you? Why? Because Why everybody knows you don't spoil the evidence. Well, we're doing exactly that with PST. Okay, so that's a long-winded explanation as to why, but I'm always looking for good tools that allows lawyers to do what they need to do, which is look at that email, but without changing the metadata without editing anything, without putting their digital fingerprints on that. And this is one of the greatest tools. So Goldfinch, it's a very small e-discovery company. In fact, it was three people that they were, they were graduates, I think at, at, at Iowa, from the University of Iowa, <laughs> which is not typically an e-discovery well, hotbed. But I met, these, I met these three gentlemen at a legal technology conference for, I think it was maybe here in Ohio at the Bar Association. And I was very impressed with what they were doing, hmm. sort of bootstrapping things, right? There's a yeah. lot of great tools out there like Logical and Everlaw and Disco and Lexby and Nextpoint and all of these will upload a PST file. But these folks, uh, Anith is the gentleman's, the CEO of Goldfinch, and he said, we get this request all the time. We're going to put a free PST oh. viewer based under Goldfinch. If you go to goldfinch.com or just Google PST viewer from Goldfinch, and Goldfinch is spelled G-O-L-D-F-Y-N-C-H. 
it was based on Atticus Finch, that whole thing. That's part of, that's where they came from. But Cute. it's in the browser. It's a browser-based tool, Adriana, so that you can go to a PST file. You can upload it. it. Everything stays secure. You're not uploading anything to their server. It's all uh, scripted so that it everything stays on your computer. And it doesn't let you go through and do everything with it, but it will give you at least an insight into what the message says, who replied to who, where it was forwarded, what different subfolders that they have in there. So you're not gonna be able to do all the review. If you wanna do that, you need to pay to actually load it into the full Goldfinch review platform. But I tell people at least use this free viewer to get an idea and a sense of what is contained in this PST file because many times the clients just say, here it is, you look right. at it, you deal with it. So at least you can get an idea so that you, as the lawyer, can make a better strategy of what the next steps are gonna be. All right, I get too crazy passionate about talking about this, but no, that's, that's what the Goldfinch is. You know, that's one of those tools that people ask me about all the time, attorneys, I don't do litigation support, which is why I send them to you. But um, that's one no of those No one wants tools. to do that. <laughs> no, nobody does. It's okay. So that's great. That's very, very helpful. Okay, next one I'm going to ask you about. I watched your very cool video and podcast with your wife about Tunnel Bear. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but before I forget, you also do, and is this where I saw it? Appsinlaw.com, right? Yes. Wow, A-P-P-S. Thank you, yes. Yes. inlaw.com. Well, I send people there all the time and I actually post a lot of your reviews to the San Diego County Bar where I, oh, I work part-time as their technology advisor for their members. Yes. But you do yes. great reviews at appsinlaw.com on well, apps that's, for that's iPads my fun and iPads. Site. That's my yeah. fun website. I love it. If I, in fact, I would just, I'll say quickly, I just posted a video that is going nuts right now because this is what everybody's asking about but we already talked about Zoom. So I had seven tips on how to use Zoom on your iPhone and iPad oh, great. specifically. Oh, because, good. you know, everybody's using their Mac yeah. and, their com and their computer, which is great. But there are some really nifty little tips that you can incorporate on the iPhone and the iPad specifically, which is, which is great. In fact, somebody just posted a comment on my, the LinkedIn post, like this frees up your computer, right? If you want to do some other work while That's you're great. on a zoom call, you could just have the zoom sitting there on your iPhone or on your iPad. Like for example, there's a little nifty tip in the, on the iPhone called safe driving mode. So you could switch over to there. Yeah. So anyway, thank you again for mentioning that appsinlaw.com yeah. is my website. And you can go there and I have a podcast on that as, yep. as well as, as doing these little videos or just YouTube videos. But anyway, this Zoom iOS tips is really pretty hot right now. Yeah. And I, I knew that it would. And I wanted just to give some good tips for people that were uh, using it on their iPhone and iPad. Mm. So freaking helpful. I don't know how you have time to do all this stuff because I wish I could do <laughs> all the We're always working. Stuff. That's it. I know. Always working. <laughs> is that where I saw the Tunnel Bear video? Yes. Yeah. We, we Tell put us that about somewhere. Tunnel yeah. Bear because that's another thing that a lot of people have been asking about now is do I need a VPN? What is a VPN? So give us the breakdown real simple like you did with the other yeah. tools, which what is a VPN and why do I need it? And why would I use something called Tunnel Bear? Which is yeah, super absolutely. Cute name. So, so this is one of the things, and hopefully, one other thing we can quickly talk about also is password managers. Oh, like, I can't. If everyone would just you get have a time, freaking password manager, you have time now to spend fifteen to twenty minutes studying up on password managers and VPNs, just so that you know what they do. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. It's a very fancy, like matrix sounding term, but basically all it means, or what I typically describe it as, is when you are using a public Wi-Fi, like one that doesn't require a password of some kind, and immediately, Adriana, you jump into, I'm thinking of Starbucks, and everybody jumps on the same Wi-Fi, you can use a VPN to basically add an additional layer of security on those open public Wi-Fis. So I use open public Wi-Fis all the time. Nothing specifically wrong with them. If I'm surfing Facebook or just getting on a website, I don't really have that much of a concern of what somebody may be sniffing data packets out of the air or knowing what I'm going into, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. But if I know that I'm going to connect into a secure portal from a client, for example, I need to download some documents, or I basically want to send email, I will typically trigger the VPN to be turned on at that point 
before I do something that I want to just have that extra layer of security. Now, so you're creating yeah. sort of a security envelope around your existing yes. internet connection yeah. that creates this basically a, a private tunnel between your computer and whatever you're sending the information to. Yeah. Over this exactly. free Wi-Fi. Do I need a VPN if I'm going to my bank? So let's say I'm a, I'm at the airport and I want to check my balance, but my bank provides HTTPS, right? So it's a right. secure connection. Do I need a VPN for that? I would typically not say you need one, but I would tell you just like I'm sure you run into Adriana, mm -hmm. a lot of people, if, once they understand how important a VPN is and what it can do, I find most people are just, just to be extra safe. Sure. But if, if I know I'm going to a site that uses HTTPS, I, I just like I think where you're going with that, I, I, don't, I don't worry about that quite as much because I know that I'm secure. Okay. That means, that, H, that S means that I'm encrypted in that, in that connection. But let's but, talk about email, which is the yeah. example that you gave because <laughs> yes. email is one of the least secure methods of sending a communication, except right. for, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but here's the explanation I give. If you're a G Suite user and you're emailing another G Suite user, that connection between the Gmail and the G Suite servers is actually encrypted. So if you're G Suite to G Suite, you've got a secure encrypted connection because the two endpoints are in the same family. If you're a Microsoft Office 365 user sending to another Office 365 user who's getting their services directly from Microsoft, also encrypted and secure because it's in the same ecosystem and family, right? Right. Yeah. The now, key that you're saying there quickly, yes. those are paid versions yes, of those. Right. Not the free Gmail, nope. not the free Outlook.com. Okay. No. Nope. Now, here's the other thing. How many of you have ever asked your clients are you an Office 365 user or are you a G Suite user? So the point here is we have no idea because we just email wildly. We don't take an inventory of what our clients are using. So in that case, if you're emailing a client, I could actually, here, let me give you an example. I was emailing with attorneys last week. I had two, you're not gonna even believe this when I tell you, two attorneys <laughs> using PacBell dot oh net my. email addresses. I had wow. one with an AOL. I had another one still using Earthlink. <laughs> this is 1987. Calling. And by the way, these are lawyers. Wow. So the point there being, obviously, if that is the domain name, you know that it's a different service than what you're using. But yeah. lawtechpartners.com is provided through Gmail. So I guess my point is when you're not sure if you have a secure and encrypted connection, and especially with something like just emailing a, a client or someone else, a VPN is a good idea. Absolutely. And there are several VPN options out there. Many of us have probably heard of or seen ads for Nord VPN, N-O-R-D, or Express VPN. I find those at least are the two that come up a lot. Yeah. Th both of those are fantastic. They're great. And sometimes there's good deals on them. And if you want to get one of those, that's fine. But for people that are just, if you are going to take 15, 20 minutes in your, in your downtime, downtime. As it were, to learn about VPN. This is one service that I have loved. And I just, I just, I tell people, this is a good place to start to get your head wrapped around what it does. And it's tunnel bear, just like it sounds tunnelbear.com. It's so cute, Adriana. I love it. Like <laughs> little, if you go to tunnelbear.com, I'm going. The graphics that they use, it's it, it just it it feels like you're hugging a teddy bear. It's just fantastic. <laughs> and, and it's what's a secure great about, private teddy bear. It's so cute. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they, they're draw, once you get to the website, you'll see what I'm talking I'm about. But at it. yeah, it's cute. It has apps available for the iPad and the iPhone and your Mac and Windows. And so, what's great about the app on the iPhone and iPad? Because I typically find I work with a lot of people using the iPad. You don't have to have it turned on all the time, but you can actually go into the settings in iOS and create a profile for the VPN. Some people can do that, but to me, I find most users just don't want to deal with it. If you download the app for TunnelBear, you can get it for free. You can try this out for free. They give you up to 500 megabytes each month for free, plenty of space and, and bandwidth to let you test this out. But you simply just open the little app on your iPad or iPhone, and at the very top, there's an off and on button. You turn it on and you actually watch the little bear dig 
into the <laughs> ground, dig a tunnel, and he comes out and pops out of the tunnel that he's dug, and you know then that it's turned on. And by the oh. way, on iOS and the iPhone or the iPad, you know that you're protected by the VPN because very helpfully in the upper right corner of yeah. the iPad or iPhone, it, it says VPN. So you know it's turned on and you know it's running. Awesome. I had a, a, a client I worked with that she traveled to Argentina for, well, several months ago. She was traveling around, but she was just nervous about the fact she was checking email while she was at this hotel in Argentina. Yeah. I think it was a conference or something. Well, she subscribed, I think it was $56 a year for yeah, a full subscription to Tunnel Bear. It's $3 a month. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, so now she just had it turned on all the time. So she knew any time that she went into her email and checked it on the iPad or surfed to, uh, she had to upload, I think, a document to a, a court website while she was there. All of that has been doubly and additionally protected now by, by the VPN. And when you're ready to turn it off, if you don't want to use all 500 megabytes for free each month, you just go back into the Tunnel Bear app and hit off and it just stops for you on there. Cool. And then you can surf. I have found this is just a very nice, way to introduce yourself to the concept of what a VPN does. Because in my mind, Adriana, every legal professional should know this. The competency aspect is at least having an understanding of it. You don't have to be an expert on it. You don't need to know all the ins and outs. But once you get familiar with and comfortable with Tunnel Bear, you could upgrade to something like Express or NordVPN. That's fine. Or any of the others. But this is a good place to start. It's your gateway VPN. That's right. No pun <laughs> intended. And so um, cute. Look, it's a it teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take another break for just a couple of minutes, listen to some messages from some sponsors, and we'll wrap things up with a couple more of our favorite uh, tools, tips, and services. Artificial intelligence won't outpace lawyers anytime soon, but lawyers who use AI are already outpacing lawyers who do not. With Ross Intelligence, lawyers conducting legal research leverage AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Ask a question on the Ross Legal Research Platform and Ross will return on point case law. Go to rossintelligence.com today and get a 14-day free trial. Use promo code LEGALTALK for 10% off. If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexa's virtual receptionists are available 24-7 to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm's software, and much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. It's so cute when a guy says, that is so cute. So Brett Bernie's my guest today and we just got finished talking about <laughs> Tunnel Bear. It's got very cute graphics. It's a good VPN that Brett recommends. Thanks, Brett, for, for hanging in there with me. A couple Absolutely. more tips I want to grab for, from you. From the e-discovery litigation support side, you gave us Goldfinch as a great PST viewer option and then also as a, a pretty decent doc review tool. But when you've got a, a small firm comes to you and says, oh man, we've been pitted up against Goliath. We're David down yeah. here. What's an affordable cloud base? Like what are your two or three top favorite e-discovery tools, if you don't mind sharing? Not at all. In fact, I will um, humbly uh, push another quick website, but Great. I don't get Please anything do. from it. It's a, it's a free download, but for exactly this question, Adriana, oh, good. we didn't even set this up, which is great no. and I appreciate it. But for folks that are asking this a specific question, there is a guide that Chelsea Lambert and I work together. Oh, you yes. know, you know, Chelsea, of it's course. called literally the e-discovery buyer's guide. So e-discoverybuyersguide.com. It's a free download you can go to now. We're going to update it later this year, but it is going to cover all of these companies. And I'm just going to quickly mention uh, and more on there, but this would be a great place for folks to go mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, check out some of these. You Excellent know, we, resource. We even have not only just the written reviews, but we have little three minute video reviews of them as well. So you can kind of get a flavor for these different platforms. Just like anything else, Adriana, the cloud has definitely changed this industry. And so today for most firms that come to me, unless they have some very, very specific requirements on certain data that they're dealing with that, you know, has to be stored, not in the cloud of some kind, although those are becoming less and less every day. Really? But 
Most of the time for any firm that comes to me, I'm going to be recommending some kind of a cloud-based tool mm -hmm. today. And in fact, I work with a lot of firms just like you do, but specifically on litigation support. They come to me, they ask for like, can you do an assessment of here's what we're getting ready to do. This is some of the matters that we deal with year to year. What are the best tools that we can look for? along with the right workflows and everything on that. And so typically today, I look at what they've used in the past because in the past, just like everything else in technology, it used to be a big server and client software they'd have to update and everything. No more today. There's so many great tools that you can use. Probably the top that come to mind, I, I think I've already mentioned them, is Logical, mm -hmm. L-O-G-I-K-C-U-L-L, -L, is one that has been around from the, the dawn, almost the mm -hmm. dawn of the cloud, at least in the legal world. Along those lines, Everlaw is another great one. Lexby, L-E-X-B-E. And then another one from Chicago is NextPoint, nextpoint.com. They've been around for a very long mm -hmm. time as well. Uh, Disco is out there and Goldfinch. And then now that's many, again, you can go to that e-discovery buyer's guide and you can get a little more in-depth about that because I know not everybody does the e-discovery or the litigation side. But is, uh, one more quickly, I'll just, I'll just say, yeah. I always find out if your firm is using Lexus or Thomson Reuters. And the main reason, again, specifically for the e-discovery side, Thomson Reuters has done a very good job of creating their own cloud-based document review platform, which I like for a couple of good reasons. You can read the review on there, but they have a pre-review side and a review side, which is great because you can load a lot of stuff into the pre-review without getting charged for it oh, so that you can do some basic searches, some basic filtering. I say only want to know, I want to want to see emails from John to Sarah, you know, in 2012. And that's it, right? I don't want to see all the others on there. But then you can move that into the review side and you only get charged for what you put into the review side. Now, I find some firms put too much over there, but that's where a lot of times I try to help them and understand why is it important to filter out some of that information on there. So those are, I know that's a lot of names there, but if you go to that guide, you'll get a lot more details about each one so you can compare them for yourself. I think that's great. Are summation and concordance still a thing? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. See, this is, is how <laughs> this is why I like you so much because it's like you and I've been doing this for so long. <laughs> the short answer, no. Oh, in fact, summation. So that's when I talk about that server client. Like uh -huh. I worked with summation back in the day, just like I know it's crossed your in front of you several times, Adriana. Summation was actually acquired by a company called Access Data, and which which is great, but they have kept the name summation, but it's a completely cloud-based tool now that they that they offer there. Okay. Concordance was actually purchased by Lexus. And then about a year and a half ago, maybe actually two years ago, they sold it to a company in Texas called Cloud9. So they are continuing that desktop. The only reason I think some of that's still around is because there are many firms that were that have been using this <laughs> for for 20 years plus and they didn't want to move off of it or they have cases, you know, that that still require to be on there. But but both of those platforms are still around in some form or fashion, but just not the same. And for today's matters, you know, like they just didn't do email very well in the past. I mean, they do it, but it was sort of yeah. not when they were developed. So anyway, today, some of these cloud-based tools are much better at handling the data that we come in contact with today. I love it. Okay. Another question for you um, on your iPad. Well, let me ask you this. Which iPad do you have? I am still rocking. Let's see. This is the 2018 iPad Pro. The big ten, one? Is that the big, big one? Not the big, big one. Okay. I'm, okay. I'm actually waiting till what, next month? Hopefully, if things, you know, if shipping is still a thing, I want to get the newest one with that new keyboard that Apple just announced. They sort of had a silent rollout. Every March, they typically announce new yeah. hardware iPads. It was kind of a silent rollout because they didn't do a big, you know, to do and, and announcement and everything because with everything going on. But yeah, I'm going to wait till uh, I'm hopefully next Next month, I want to get the whole kit and caboodle. The the new keyboard that costs three hundred and fifty dollars just by itself. What? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's it's a sickness. It's a critical business tool, Brett. I I, agree. I just told you about That's all what... my babies. You've got to have your own set of babies. I, these are my babies. These exactly. are your babies. Um, do you have the pen? Of course. Yeah. 
What do you use for PDF manipulation and annotation with your iPad and your pen? Give me your yeah. one or two favorites. Well, of course, I'm going to give you four, but but, but it, I break it out in two different things, I promise. So quickly, just for writing notes, if people do want to go to absentlaw.com, I just talked with Jeff Richardson. <laughs> I He's think on my short list here. I was going to ask you. Yep. Oh, you got to talk with him. So about two or three months ago, we had this whole show where he was literally telling me exactly how he uses good notes on mm -hmm. the iPad. So that is his go-to note-taking application. So in other words, instead of using a yellow legal pad, this is what he uses for everything. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, you'll have to talk with him about it. Good notes we t is the one that he has used, but the other one that I use specifically for handwriting notes, as in replacing my yellow legal pad, is notability. So good notes and notability are the two by far the best. It even, as long as your handwriting is mostly legible, it'll even let you search your handwriting. It's, a, it's astounding to me how good these apps are becoming. So for handwriting notes, which by the way, it's not just handwriting. I use notability and good notes. Not only do I handwrite, but I type in there. I take pictures and insert them. I take pictures of documents and insert sections in there. Just crazy what you can do with some of these uh, note-taking applications. On the PDF, I get I, I call it sort of call it file management apps on there. The two that I typically still use today are PDF Expert by number one by far. There's one called Good Reader, not not associated with Good Notes, but Good Reader been around for a long time. PDF Expert is from a company called Readle, R-E-A-D-D-L-E. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's still by far one of the best. I, I tell it to folks this way, that in the past, I used to print out articles or download law review articles. And, you know, before I jumped on a plane or wanted <laughs> to go sit somewhere and I would have this little pencil case of different colored highlighters because each color meant something different to me or pens, different colored pens. And I would sit there and painstakingly organize my entire notes and what I wrote in the margin. Today, I use PDF Expert for all of that. I pull up Excellent. a PDF. Yep. I can highlight the text in whatever color I want, underline it right in the margins. I can zoom in on sections, copy and paste. Just amazing from doing all the annotation tools on there. But PDF Expert to me is so great because since I use Dropbox and OneDrive and Google Drive yep. and Box, <laughs> I, can all connect, your babies. I can connect PDF Expert directly to those services. So I don't have to like jump back and forth between different apps and I can synchronize a folder from Dropbox into PDF Expert. So just like we do, Adriana, on our on our Macs, right? We synchronize folders from Dropbox down yeah. to the Mac on the hard drive. Well, we don't have that completely on the iPad, but I do it through PDF Expert. And it's great Excellent. because I can then go out of the office, highlight, mark up a, a PDF file. And since it synchronizes back to Dropbox, guess what? When I get back to the office, all of those changes and those edits are right there. And PDF Expert will also let me handle Word documents, I can't edit Word documents in PDF Expert, but I can view it. It's almost like that's my manila folder, if you will. Like sure. before I leave the office, I'm gonna to go to a meeting or I used to go to a meeting. I'll just make sure that I have that entire folder synchronized in, to my iPad very good. in PDF Expert. And then I know that I have everything local and available right there. So quickly, Goodreader is another good one. And I Annotate is another one that a lot of people like as well. I've done some, some videos on that on my website. I Annotate is another good one. So those are the three, PDF Expert, Great. Goodreader, and I Annotate. And can you, um, because this is coming up a lot too, can you sign a PDF and sort of flatten it using those tools or do you use something else for something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's great. So, so there's different ways to do this. The simplest way is exactly what you're talking about. PDF Expert does this brilliantly. I can pull up a PDF. In fact, I can even fill in a form. So I can download a form from a court website and I can tap the little field and type in the information, just like if you were on you know, Adobe Acrobat on your computer. And then at the end, I can use the pen, the Apple Pencil yeah. on my iPad, and I can create my signature and stamp it right in there. And of course, you know this because you, you teach people like this. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to you teach this for so long now, <laughs> which is great. But you can go in and flatten that PDF so that when you send it to somebody, they can see your signature, but they can't click it and delete it or something along right. those and lines. Normally I say, look, if somebody's going to steal your signature, they're going to steal your signature. That's not Absolutely. what you're worried about. You're more worried about someone is flipping through 
either using their their surface or their tablet and they're going to accidentally flick your signature off to the right. right and that's not only embarrassing but i mean you don't yeah. want that to happen so i encourage right. the flattening of of annotations on a pdf file more than anything just to keep it intact yeah. so oh so you yeah. said pdf reader does that pdf expert expert yes, PDF, pdf for expert, expert. sorry but, but um, you know and the when acrobat you app, app does too well, it was just gonna, when when you talk about like the Adobe Reader, there's there's several services that are available for e-signatures, right? Now that's some call it e-signature versus digital signature, and there's ways that you can add some additional you know technology mm -hmm. again to ensure that who's signing it is actually who they say is signing it. But like, is it Adobe Sign or eSign? And there's DocuSign and Hello, and Hello Sign. Sign. There's so many yeah. of them. So those are services that you can use. But right. I like where you were going with with what you were saying because right. in my Something mind, Something more simple. It's the easiest. Right. It's the easiest way to do it. Just make sure that you flatten that a, a PDF before you send it off to somebody. Right. Yep. I think that's a great tip. Well, Brett, I feel like I need to have you back every once in a while so we can go through <laughs> our lists and, and share. Too fun. More. Yeah, it is too fun. But before I forget, I do want to go back and visit a couple of names that you dropped, which are great resources for lawyers and legal professionals. And I just want to make sure we give a shout out to them because you did, but I want to make it proper. So David Sparks is an attorney in LA, one of the sweetest, kindest, nicest yeah. people. Actually, I'm going to say that about Jeff Richardson too. Good. But David Sparks has been an attorney who's focused very much on Max for lawyers. Yeah. And I think is it MaxSparky.com is his it is. website? You got it. Max Sparky. That's right. M-A-C Sparky, because his last name is Sparks, is he's a great website, not always geared specifically toward lawyers. He's just a great contributor to the betterment of the use of technology in general. But because he's a lawyer, he does focus on that. Does he still have his podcast? Mac Power users? Yep, okay. Mac Power users. Yep. Uh, you know, I'll just I'll put in a quick plug. He's done several great little, he calls them field guides. If you go to yes. MaxSparky.com, inexpensive. One that I love is Siri shortcuts. Yes. So if you have an iPad and an iPhone and you haven't explored what Siri shortcuts, not just she who should not be named, but the shortcuts <laughs> aspect of it there, because that can really automate some fantastic things in on your iOS world. Okay. So Jeff Richardson is someone else that yeah. you mentioned. I have had both of these guys on my show um, years ago. I should have them come back. But Jeff Richardson writes at iPhoneJD.com. Correct. He's um, a fellow New Orleanian, although he's a real New Orleanian. He's from here. And he also does great reviews and tips and tricks for attorneys using iOS devices. So that's another great website. And we should yeah. definitely give a, a bigger shout out to Chelsea and all the hard work she does. Chelsea Lambert runs LexTechReview.com. Right. And is that where your guide goes through or is that a separate site? Yeah, actually, we've even expanded a little bit more on that. She yep. has a media group now that she's working with, and I work with her on the publishing division. We just actually released a document management guide, buyer's guide in a similar fashion. Uh, in fact, we're getting ready to do a virtual law firm guide as well because, well, everybody's doing that right now. Yeah, but it's helpful, it's right, and useful. But, yeah, we're doing that. When she and I started, she did a legal technology buyer's guide many years ago. Yeah. And when I saw that, in fact, Ernie Svensson put us together, which I had known Chelsea many years ago when she was in the Chicago Bar Association. Yeah, right. But I saw what she did and I'm like, that's exactly what I want to do to answer the question from the e-discovery side, just like what we talked about earlier. So yes, that's where she and I started working together and it's been fantastic. Great. That's another great resource. Um, Chelsea does a lot of reviews on all kinds of software and services. Yeah. So that's another great resource for you. And you just mentioned Ernie, which I will also mention. <laughs> Good. Um, I had Ernie on, on a couple of weeks ago because he's also here in New Orleans and, um, Ernie Svensson runs Law Firm Autopilot. It's a great program for helping yeah. lawyers run their businesses better. Um, Brett, you and I are both participating in his now virtual conference, which is going to happen in May. Yes. And I will give a shout out to that, which is if you're interested in learning more about how to better use technology, go to lawfirmautopilot.com and spend some time with me and Brett and a bunch of other smart legal technologists online. Brett, before I let you go, please remind everyone what your main points of contact are, although I think we've gotten so many good ones from <laughs> you. You're, you're, you're hard to hide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say right now, my favorite is, and, and by the way, thank you, Adriana. You're so generous in, in making sure that people can hear about <laughs> all these great resources. Yeah. In fact, I'll just quickly say, Jeff Richardson just recently, I think last Thursday, put up this long post on using Microsoft Teams 
on an iPhone and I an iPad, Teams. right? We were okay. talking about oh, Zoom cool. and that's what I did. But that is a great post, especially for a lot of lawyers that are using Teams instead of Zoom, which everybody's upset about Zoom security. I just tweeted out, by the way, there's a story that, you know, Zoom is not end-to-end decrypted. Yeah. And I tweeted mm-hmm. out, guess what else isn't end-to-end decrypted? Anything? Email. Yeah, But exactly. fortunately, lawyers never use email to send confidential information. So right. we're, we're okay with that. Okay, anyway, just a little tongue-in-cheek well, there. Well, you don't even want it. When, when they started to asking me about that, I said, are you on Facebook? Do you use exactly. Gmail? Do you have a Dropbox? <laughs> do you email with your clients? Do you text with your clients? Please don't come at me about Zoom right now. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> don't That's what everybody's me. using. <laughs> so I, I'll just say thank you again for all that you do, Adriana, and just oh, putting sure, this no. out because it's just such great. You're, you're tireless at making sure that people get notified and, and uh, <laughs> informed about where to go. So thank you. Sure. Um, the main website I do, the, the one that's most fun right now is appsinlaw.com. So that's where sure. right now I'm posting the little videos and talking to folks about what they're doing. I've got several shows coming out that talk to attorneys right now and like, how are they doing everything virtually? And of course, everybody just kind of wants to know what are, what's other people doing right now. So appsinlaw.com, is, that's probably the best place to go and find me. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. This has been so fun. I always enjoy talking and hanging out with you and hope that I actually get to see you in person sometime soon. I so, know we were going to come to New Orleans, like you said, next month, but <laughs> hey, this is the new norm. It's just, it's great to talk with you, Adriana. I appreciate your time very, very much. I hope you all found this episode helpful. I sure did. I always enjoy talking to Brett. So thank you for listening to another episode of New Solo on Legal Talk Network. If you like what you've heard, I'd love for you to subscribe, share, rate, and give us a good review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. And remember, you're not alone. You're New Solo. Thanks for listening to New Solo with host Adriana Linares. Tune in again to learn more about how to successfully run your new practice solo here on Legal Talk Network. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.